Chapter forty eight of North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall. North and South by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Chapter twenty eight. Ne'er to be found again. My own, my father's friend, I cannot part with thee. I ne'er have shown. Thou ne'er hast known how dear thou art to me. Anonymous The elements of the dinner-parties which Mrs. Lennox gave were these. Her friends contributed the beauty, Captain Lennox the easy knowledge of the subjects of the day, and Mr. Henry Lennox, and the sprinkling of rising men who were received as his friends, brought the wit, the cleverness, the keen and extensive knowledge of which they knew well enough how to avail themselves without seeming pedantic or burdening the rapid flow of conversation. These dinners were delightful, but even here Margaret's dissatisfaction found her out. Every talent, every feeling, every acquirement, nay, even every tendency towards virtue was used up as materials for fireworks. The hidden, sacred fire exhausted itself in sparkle and crackle. They talked about art in a merely sensuous way, dwelling on outside effects instead of allowing themselves to learn what it has to teach. They lashed themselves up into an enthusiasm about high subjects in company, and never thought about them when they were alone. They squandered their capabilities of appreciation into a mere flow of appropriate words. One day, after the gentlemen had come up into the drawing-room, Mr. Lennox drew near to Margaret, and addressed her, in almost the first voluntary words, he had spoken to her since she had returned to live in Harley Street. "'You did not look pleased at what Shirley was saying at dinner.' "'Didn't I? My face must be very expressive,' replied Margaret. "'It always was. It has not lost the trick of being eloquent.' "'I did not like,' said Margaret hastily, "'his way of advocating what he knew to be wrong, "'so glaringly wrong, even in jest. "'But it was very clever. "'How every word told. "'Do you remember the happy epithets?' "'Yes.' "'And despise them, you would like to add. "'Pray, don't scruple, though he is my friend.' "'There! "'That is the exact tone in you that—' "'She stopped short. "'He listened for a moment to see if she would finish her sentence.' but she only reddened and turned away. Before she did so, however, she heard him say in a very low, clear voice, "'If my tones or modes of thought are what you dislike, will you do me the justice to tell me so, and so give me the chance of learning to please you?' All these weeks there was no intelligence of Mr. Bell's going to Milton. He had spoken of it at Hellstone, as of a journey which he might have to take in very short time from then. But he must have transacted his business by writing, Margaret thought, ere now, and she knew that if he could, he would avoid going to a place which he disliked, and moreover would little understand the secret importance which she affixed to the explanation that could only be given by word of mouth. She knew that he would feel that it was necessary that it should be done, but whether in summer, autumn, or winter, it would signify very little. It was now August and there had been no mention of the Spanish journey to which she had alluded to Edith, and Margaret tried to reconcile herself to the fading away of this illusion. But one morning she received a letter, saying that next week he meant to come up to town. He wanted to see her about a plan which she had in his head, and moreover he intended to treat himself to a little doctoring, as he had begun to come round to her opinion that it would be pleasanter to think that his health was more in fault than he, when he found himself irritable and cross. There was altogether a tone of forced cheerfulness in the letter, as Margaret noticed afterwards, but at the time her attention was taken up by Edith's exclamations. "'Coming up to town! Oh, dear! And I am so worn out by the heat that I don't believe I have strength enough in me for another dinner. Besides, everybody has left but our dear stupid selves, who can't settle where to go. There would be nobody to meet him. I'm sure he would much rather come and dine with us quite alone than with the most agreeable strangers you could pick up. Besides, if he is not well, he won't wish for invitations. I am glad he has owned it at last. I was sure he was ill from the whole tone of his letters, and yet he would not answer me when I asked him, and I had no third person to whom I could apply for news. Oh, he is not very ill, or he would not think of Spain. He never mentions Spain. No, but his plan that is to be proposed evidently relates to that. 
But would you really go in such weather as this? Oh, it will get cooler every day. Yes, think of it. I am only afraid I have thought and wished too much, in that absorbing, willful way which is sure to be disappointed, or else gratified to the letter, while in the spirit it gives no pleasure. But that's superstitious, I'm sure, Margaret. No, I, I don't think it is. Only it ought to warn me, and check me from giving way to such passionate wishes. It is a sort of, give me children, or else I die. I'm afraid my cry is, let me go to Cadiz, or else I die. My dear Margaret, you'll be persuaded to stay there. And then what shall I do? Oh, I wish I could find somebody for you to marry here, that I could be sure of you. I shall never marry. Nonsense, and double nonsense. Why, as Sholto says, you're such an attraction to the house, that he knows ever so many men who will be glad to visit here next year for your sake. Margaret drew herself up haughtily. Do you know, Edith, I sometimes think your Corfu life has taught you— Well, just a shade or two of coarseness. Edith began to sob so bitterly, and to declare so vehemently, that Margaret had lost all her love for her, and no longer looked upon her as a friend, that Margaret came to think that she had expressed too harsh an opinion for the relief of her own wounded pride, and ended by being Edith's slave for the rest of the day, while that little lady, overcome by wounded feeling, lay like a victim on the sofa, heaving occasionally a profound sigh, till at last she fell asleep. Mr. Bell did not make his appearance even on the day to which he had for a second time deferred his visit. The next morning there came a letter from Wallace, his servant, stating that his master had not been feeling well for some time, which had been the true reason of his putting off his journey, and that at the very time when he should have set out for London he had been seized with an apoplectic fit. It was, indeed, Wallace added, the opinion of the medical men that he could not survive the night, and more than probable that by the time Miss Hale received this letter his poor master would be no more. Margaret received this letter at breakfast-time, and turned very pale as she read it. Then, silently putting it into Edith's hands, she left the room. Edith was terribly shocked as she read it, and cried in a sobbing, frightened, childish way, much to her husband's distress. Mrs. Shaw was breakfasting in her own room, and upon him devolved the task of reconciling his wife to the near contact into which she seemed to be brought with death, for the first time that she could remember in her life. Here was a man who was to have dined with them to-day, lying dead or dying instead. It was some time before she could think of Margaret. Then she started up and followed her upstairs into her room. Dixon was packing up a few toilette articles, and Margaret was hastily putting on her bonnet, shedding tears all the time and her hands trembling, so that she could hardly tie the strings. "'Oh, dear Margaret, how shocking! What are you doing? Are you going out? Sholto would telegraph, or do anything you like. I am going to Oxford. There is a train in half an hour. Dixon has offered to go with me, but I could have gone by myself. I must see him again. Besides, he may be better, and want some care. He has been like a father to me. Don't stop me, Edith.' "'But I must. Mamma won't like it at all. Come and ask her about it, Margaret. You don't know where you're going. I should not mind if he had a house of his own, but in his fellows' rooms? Come to Mamma and do ask her before you go. It will not take a minute.' Margaret yielded and lost her train. In the suddenness of the event, Mrs. Shaw became bewildered and hysterical, and so the precious time slipped by. But there was another train in a couple of hours, and after various discussions on propriety and impropriety, it was decided that Captain Lennox should accompany Margaret, as the one thing to which she was constant was her resolution to go, alone or otherwise, by the next train, whatever might be said of the propriety or impropriety of the step. Her father's friend, her own friend, was lying at the point of death, and the thought of this came upon her with such vividness that she was surprised herself at the firmness with which she asserted something of her right to independence of action and five minutes before the time for starting she found herself sitting in a railway carriage opposite to captain lennox it was always a comfort to her to think that she had gone though it was only to hear that he had died in the night she saw the rooms that he had occupied and associated them ever after most fondly in her memory with the idea of her father and his one cherished and faithful friend they had promised edith before starting that if all had ended as they feared they would return to dinner. So that long, lingering look around the room in which her father had died had to be interrupted, and a quiet farewell taken of the kind old face that had so often come out with pleasant words and merry quips and cranks. Captain Lennox fell asleep on their journey home, 
and Margaret could cry at leisure, and bethink her of this fatal year, and all the woes it had brought to her. No sooner was she fully aware of one loss than another came, not to supersede her grief for the one before, but to reopen wounds and feelings scarcely healed. But at the sound of the tender voices of her aunt and Edith, of merry little Sholto's glee at her arrival, and at the sight of the well-lighted rooms with their mistress pretty in her paleness and her eager sorrowful interest, Margaret roused herself from the heavy trance of almost superstitious hopelessness, and began to feel that even around her joy and gladness might gather. She had Edith's place on the sofa, Sholto was taught to carry Aunt Margaret's cup of tea very carefully to her, and by the time she went up to dress, she could thank God for having spared her dear old friend a long or a painful illness. But when night came, solemn night, and all the house was quiet, Margaret still sat watching the beauty of a London sky at such an hour, on such a summer evening. The faint pink reflection of earthly lights on the soft clouds that float tranquilly into the white moonlight, out of the warm gloom which lies motionless around the horizon. Margaret's room had been the day-nursery of her childhood, just when it merged into girlhood, and when the feelings and conscience had first been awakened into full activity. On some such night as this, she remembered promising herself to live as brave and noble a life as any heroine she ever read or heard of in a romance, a life sans pure et sans reproach. It had seemed to her then that she had only to will, and such a life would be accomplished. And now she had learnt that not only to will, but also to pray, was a necessary condition in the truly heroic. Trusting to herself, she had fallen. It was a just consequence of her sin, that all excuses for it, all temptation to it, should remain for ever unknown to the person in whose opinion it had sunk her lowest. She stood face to face at last with her sin. She knew it for what it was. Mr. Bell's kindly sophistry, that nearly all men were guilty of equivocal actions, and that the motive ennobled the evil, had never had much real weight with her. Her own first thought of how, if she had known all, she might have fearlessly told the truth, seemed low and poor. Nay, even now, her anxiety to have her character for truth partially excused in Mr. Thornton's eyes, as Mr. Bell had promised to do, was a very small and petty consideration, now that she was afresh taught by death what life should be. If all the world spoke, acted, or kept silence with intent to deceive, if dearest interests were at stake, and dearest lives in peril, if no one should ever know of her truth or her falsehood to measure out their honour or contempt for her by, straight alone where she stood, in the presence of God, she prayed that she might have strength to speak and act the truth for evermore. End of chapter 48 Recorded by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, October 2007